Uh, later on, of course, um, things became more diversified and the monopoly broke up. Because of this, phone calls were very unreasonably expensive, almost as bad as our current cellular company's roaming charges. I couldn't believe it when I found out that my, my iPhone, to make a phone call here, $2.99 a minute? Come on, you guys. Let's make it a little bit more reasonable than that. How many here are from the telecommunications industry, actually work in telecom? Nobody. Okay. So when somebody comes along and airs their dirty laundry and finds a secure, uh, I mean a security hole in their system, it really got their attention. You really have to understand the, the kind of like my story and the, the times uh, when this took place. The, the uh, political situation in the USA at the time was Watergate, Vietnam protests, setting the stage for some really interesting times. I even been offered a high paying job. I turned it down, why? Because they were building, they were building technology to kill people and I was not gonna have any part of that. So I decided to work for a semiconductor company instead. Actually, I got a little bit more money out of them. So that was pretty cool. Phone freaking, what exactly is a phone freak? A phone freak is a person, usually blind, who is usually a loner, um, not really a social misfit, I would say, but just a person who stays at home, has nothing better to do than to play with a phone. And because they're blind, their whole wor world is audio. And when you're usually uh, blind, your, your, your hearing is much more sensitive than another normal person's because their senses are now focused, their brain power is more focused toward their hearing. Usually they have perfect pitch. Uh, they can hear sounds that we can't hear. Uh, they know every little click and pop. When you make a phone call, back then everything was mechanic. Today when you make a phone call, you don't hear any clicks and pops at all. You just dial the last digit and a few seconds later it rings and you don't hear any clicks or pops anymore. Why? Because it's all digital. Everybody changed the digital and back in the mid 80s. With their situation in super hearing, they could understand exactly how calls originate and they work throughout the vast AT&T network by listening to the faint little beep, 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 beep of the multi-frequency tones that calls go through. And usually when you make a long distance call, you can actually hear them, but it's very faint in the background because some of that audio actually will leak through back to the calling party, the person that actually makes the phone call. However, AT&T had a very, very, what they thought at the time was a cost-saving move, uh, move. They wanted to use the same voice circuits for internal switching. Bad idea. It's like leaving the keys to your house outside for anybody to come in and use, and come in and use your house. Uh, 2600 was the magic frequency that opened the gate. That's your key. Once you made a phone call over, let's say, 40 or 50 miles away, you will then have uh, go over what is called a carrier. This will be explained in the tandem stacking demo because what I'm gonna play for you is a recording that I made that was made, not by me, it was made by Doorbell back in 1975. The Captain Crunch whistle uh, was a um, device, just an ordinary whistle you get out of a Captain Crunch cereal box, just a toy whistle, but if you held the hole, um, you could actually blow the whistle and it would make a 2600 hertz tone that would be good enough to trip, trip the phone call. In fact, uh, phone freaks would often go to the airports and uh, run around blowing the whistle with a bank of telephones and everybody would get disconnected. <laughs> it was sort of like one of the earlier pranks they pulled. And uh, on earlier equipment, uh, to dial a number using just the 2600 tones was only possible when the long distance switching company at the time was using what is called single frequency 2600. So to dial a number, to dial three, you go beep, beep, beep three times. To dial five, beep, 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 beep. And you could then use those, that whistle, and it took a little bit of skill to do it. it, was all you really needed to divert a call. How do you divert a call? Easy, you just call an 800 number, toll free number, which would put you on the toll free trunk. Your local billing equipment just thinks you're calling a free number. So it's not gonna go ahead and activate your call, however, that 800 number is registered. It actually is recorded on an AMA tape. This is like a pa punched paper tape. 
that the phone company then processes to uh, tabulate and calculate what you, what you have to pay each month for your phone calls. And uh, these tapes, of course, uh, do contain uh, 2,600, uh, I mean 800 number calls. So if you call the Army recruiting office uh, 20 calls a day when you're, you know, when you're not a 4F classification trying to join the Army, uh, you pretty much stand out like a sore thumb. Later on, of course, they use multi-frequency tones. Multi-frequency, not touch tones. Uh, multi-frequency is 700 hertz, uh, 900 hertz, um, 1100, 1500, and 1700 hertz. It, they're odd frequencies. Why are they odd frequencies? Because when you mix the two together, your subtones are going to be uh, not as detectable. Um, I couldn't believe it was that easy. Um, I, I, met a, I met the blind kid that did it. I went over to his house and uh, I met him just by experimentation. I was running a, a pirate radio station and I was just experimenting around with a transmitter and I gave out my phone number just to see how many people were actually listening to it and then he called. Two weeks later, uh, he called again. But when he called, I asked him for his number and he gave me a number that was a loop around number. What's a loop around number? A loop around number is a number where you call uh, prefix 0044 and you get a 1000 hertz tone interrupted every 10 seconds. If you call the B side of the, of the number, which is the 0045 side, the tone goes away and the two of you can talk. Well, then he gave me a loop around number. At the time, I didn't know anything about all that. So I tried to call him back and I got this tone. I called the operator and complained. And she said, how'd you get that number? I said, I don't know, my friend gave it to me. She says, that's a special test kit number. Oh, really? Okay. And I hung up and just did my other, did my other thing. I couldn't believe it. So after going to, uh, after going to visit this guy, um, he, he hooked up an organ to his phone. And uh, he's an organ player. His name is Jimmy, blind of course. And he banged out um, a number on his organ. And I says, can I call my friend in Maine? Sure, why not? So he, I said, what's the number? I gave him the number and he banged it out on his organ. The first thing he did was dial a toll-free 800 number, waited for the ring, and just before they answered the phone, he sent the 2600. And you'll hear what that sounds like in just a second when I run the demo. But after that, you send the multi-frequency tones with a key pulse, which is uh, 1500 plus uh, 1700, and a start. Uh, actually, yeah, 1100, 1700 is, is a key pulse, and uh, 1500 and 1700 is start. So you mix those tones together, you had an opening tone, and then you had the number and a closing tone. Why that way? Because the switching equipment had to know how many digits to expect. So when you, when you entered that start tone, that was the end tone, that says, oh, go ahead and start processing the call. That's why they call it the start, in, even though it was at the end. It worked everywhere. No matter where I could go, I could call an 800 number, blow the Captain Crunch whistle, and tweet, kerchink, drop into a trunk. It couldn't be that easy. I just couldn't believe it. It worked everywhere. There was, it was not like a fluke in, the, in a local exchange where maybe if you flash the hook switch a certain kind of way, it would kind of dump you into some kind of an unknown trunk because it was an unexpected digit. Sometimes also if you dial the dial, and if you, you know, normally rotary dials, on the, if you dial zero, you get zero pulses. Gee, what happens if you dial 15 pulses or maybe 20 pulses? What do you get then? Well, we experimented around. And so now I'm going to begin the demo. Again, it was recorded in 1975. Uh, you'll hear a full description of each click and this uh, demo tape is on a website called um, wideweb.com slash phone trips and it's called classic tandem stacking. So just a second here I'll get it started for you. The following telephone recordings were made by Ben Decibel in January 1975. Tandem stacking was a phone freak way of playing with the phone network. This was a way of making a call go back and forth across the country many times. And usually, you would either call the phone next to you, or you'd call another phone freak. Certainly, the quality of the connection you'd get wouldn't be good enough for an average conversation. But the cool thing about it was that you would make a phone call that was so long that you could really feel the depth of it. It took on a third dimension of depth. This technique 
which I'll call classic tandem stacking, since Captain Crunch and the Esquire article made it famous, was possible because of a quirk in certain tandems that made up the long distance network of the 1970s and maybe even early 80s. Number one crossbar tandems, also called crossbar tandems or XBTs for short. Well, there were certain XBTs that would allow you to stack. Youngstown, Ohio was one of them. Here, Ben uses it to call the phone next to him through many, many links. Step one was to get onto the long distance network, usually by just simply dialing a long distance call. Anything that was more than about 75 miles out would go over a type of carrier system that would respond to 2600. The number that's ringing at this point doesn't matter. What's important is that this call has gone over a trunk from New York to a distant 4A, which can be reset by 2600. That's the supervision handshake, off hook, on hook. And now it's waiting for new digits, which Ben will supply. Stopping the tape now, what he dialed was 216 054064. These are old routing codes. The network of the 1970s had routing codes for tandems in all major cities. I might add, even though he gave six digits there, you might have actually noticed that they did eight digits. He failed to mention that he also did the key pulse and start. The first code, 216054, is the routing code for Youngstown, Ohio. The 064 in the area code of 216 is the routing code for Canton, Ohio. Both of these are crossbar tandems. When Ben keys in this sequence, the 4A into which he is keying picks up a trunk to Youngstown, Ohio and sends 064. That tick is the 4A cutting through to Youngstown, Ohio after having sent 064. Now what does Youngstown do with the 064? Well, it picks up a trunk to Canton that's the code for Canton, but having been sent only the routing code and no digits to follow it, it simply dumps us into the Canton trunk without sending anything. In other words, it stacks. That's the sound of Youngstown, Ohio dumping us into a trunk to Canton. And that's the handshake from Canton. Canton, Ohio is now ready to receive digits. You notice at that point you actually heard two handshakes, two little very short chirps of the 2600 hertz tone. One of them was from the Canton, the other one was from the uh, uh, Youngstown, Ohio. So you had the two trunks actually sending the handshake. You got to hear the handshake go back through one trunk and then the other trunk. Now that doesn't always happen. Sometimes one will actually disconnect before the other, as you'll hear in the tape. That's 054064. This causes Canton to pick up a trunk to Youngstown and send 064. Now we're in Youngstown again, which stacks into Canton, and then Canton gives us the handshake. And we'll do another 054064. Now we're in Youngstown again. Youngstown stacks to Canton. That's the handshake, and here we go again. Same digits, Youngstown, Canton, handshake. Now the connection has gotten so long that the handshake is all you can hear. Now on that supervision flash, you could really hear multiple links, both on the off hook and the on hook. He's going around again. That was such a short flash that you didn't get to hear all the onhooks. You've been listening to the beginning of the original 1975 tape, stretched to allow me to describe what's going on. Let me go back and play this part again without stopping to talk on it. Anyway, there you have part of the uh, 
of the uh, classic tandem stacking, and this is kind of what you would hear back then in the uh, in the uh, classic tandem stacking. I'm going to push the uh, the recording up to another section where they've actually stacked a humongous amount of trunks. I'm just going to try to find it here. I think it's about here. I'm going to get it exactly right. Make something flash where the connection was. And when you get a connection this long and you ring forward, assuming that it passes it along, which this one does, oh yeah, you get to hear that that little burst of forward on hook being sent, you know, just very slowly, one, then the next, then the next, then the next, all the way down. Yeah, just cascading down. You can count the links. And he does that with the tape recorder on, you know, first on the calling line and the called line. What he's sending there is a very short burst of 2600. And you can hear the 2600 ripple through all of the trunks, all the way back to the very beginning. Well, depending on how quickly you hold the 2600. If you held the 2600 down too long, it would just be like hanging up, hanging up the hook switch on your phone and picking it up and getting a dial tone. Or you can sometimes you can just hang up the phone and pick it up and you don't get a dial tone. Well, it doesn't know what to do with that because it thinks you might have dialed a one. So, um, so it's the duration of the 2600 that's is very critical here. So there you have kind of like some, some of the stuff that we did. Just, uh, of course, we always uh, try to push the limits. And I believe that the limit using this kind of technique to stack tandems is about uh, 26 trunks. And no, you really can't tie up the phone company and uh, jam all the circuits up by doing this. This is a very small subset of the phone company using older XPTs rather than 4A switching systems. Uh, a 4A switching system is what is called a four-wire switch. It switches, four, uh, it switches two audio connections going to the party you call, and then another two wires coming back from the party you call to you. Okay, so there's actually a four-wire switch, and it's called a 4A. These are very, very common on the telcos uh, starting from about 1970 until about 1982 or 1983. After about 1983, the phone company replaced those 4As with what are called 4Es. It's an electronic switching system. And it still uses four wires, of course, but it doesn't use it mechanical anymore. It does it using digital. Going back now to the slides. Some of the things that we did uh, was we also did a lot of scanning. What is scanning? Uh, how many people have seen War Games, the movie War Games? Well, that movie War Games and that scanning came from me. I was actually consulted by Universal Pictures to uh, be a technical advisor for the movie. And uh, in that movie, it showed uh, the uh, person uh, dialing up random numbers just with a computer. Uh, it's very easy to do, uh, to write a little program to do that. And it's called scanning. Or another, another term for it, a more modern term, would be called war dialing. And, and now, uh, as of about 1989, 1990 maybe, uh, war dialing became illegal. So if you get caught war dialing, you'd probably be breaking the law. So scanning produced quite a few interesting numbers, especially when you scan the Washington DC 800 prefix 424. 800 424 is the Washington DC 800 prefix. Um, that really would translate to 202 and some exchange that uh, would be uh, calling six-digit translation, would translate the uh, 80424 into a 202 number. So you're really using the same lines, even though you're dialing an 800 number, that you would be using dialing any regular normal numbers. So we came across this number, 80424-9337, by um, actually um, calling a particular person who answered the phone very rudely. And usually when you call an 800 number, they want you to call. After all, they're paying for it. So they must want you to call. Not this number. 
person we got on that other end was very, very ticked off that we called him and uh, wanted to know how he got the number and all that. Uh, and I just simply said, excuse me, I just dialed the wrong number. I'm sorry I misdialed, not hung up. But I put that down in my little notebook as saying, requires further investigation. So I thought about how I was going to be able to do that. Well, social engineering, of course, was one of the tricks we used to try to obtain information on a number. It worked for just about anywhere. And ask Kevin Mitnick about social engineering. He's the expert. Hacking uh, into this number required me to be able to, first of all, I had to impersonate a telephone company uh, person. And so what I did was I called back the number and I says, Hi, this is Bob from White Plains Toll Switching Tandem Office in White Plains, New York. And uh, we're having a translation problem going into your phone. Um, we'd like to get this fixed as soon as possible. Could you please give us the number that, that uh, uh, not the number, but could you please tell us who you are? We don't have that information in our records right now. And he says, yes, this is the White House. Uh, you've reached the CIA crisis hotline number. And uh, I said, okay. White House, CIA crisis hotline number, requires further investigation. And I gave it up for a couple of, couple of days, maybe a week. And then I said, well, I had to go on. Now, what I, next thing I had to do is I had to find the, the, the uh, six-digit translation to get the 202 number. Because it just so happens that about that time, the phone company putting in what is called auto-verify. Auto-verify is a, is a special code that you put in front of the number. You had to be in the 202 area to do it. So you dial key pulse 052 and then the prefix of the number, and then the, and then the four-digit number, and then start. That would allow you to be able to pop in on the line and listen to conversations on that phone. So you don't get busy. You'll get, a, you'll get a scrambled communication. What is meant by that is this is the way an operator can tell if a line is working or not. A lot of times, there are instances where it's important if a person is talking on the phone to, to break in on the line for an emergency. Uh, let's say you ha you're a doctor, and you're at home, and you've got a Gabby, 15-year-old kid, likes to talk on the phone a lot. How do you clear off that line so that doctor can be called for an emergency? Well, they have a system set up called AutoVerify that does that. An operator first calls the number to verify that the number is actually in working, and when they do, they just hear scrambled communications, which means that they, don't really, they can't really listen to the conversation. What they didn't count on was the fact that you can do that wink back with the 2600. That knocked off the scrambler. That meant you could hear the, they can hear the, that meant you could actually talk to the person that's on the phone. However, when you do that, you get a 10 second beep indicating that you've been recording. Um, so what we did was, we, uh, we dialed into the White House, we found the auto verify number, we sat on the line and listened for calls coming in. The minute a call came in, just at the right time, we burst into 2600, we could hear the conversation, and just before that 10 second beep come, we hung up, we got enough information to say, who, it, one person said, Olympus please. That was a code name, what we think was President Nixon. Sure enough, Nixon came on the line and said, and then there were some people talking, and we had to hang up real quickly because we didn't want to get that, that beep tone come out there so then hear it. So we hung up, wrote down, Olympus, President Nixon. So now I had some pretty valuable information one thing that phone freaks like to do is they like to trade information. So information is, is, has got some monetary value with other kinds of information. So a couple weeks later, I met some phone freaks, and they had a big party, and they'll get together and have a hackathon session or whatever. And uh, one of them demonstrated a really nice conference number, the AT&T Conference Bridge. I had to have that. You do, well, I, I got it. It was 052 or 914052 start. And that would get you into a conference bridge. With that, you can uh, tie up to 10 people together in a conference. Excellent quality. It was all 4A switching. Beautiful connections. I had to have that number. Uh, so I said, well, let's see. What have I got to trade? Ah, I got something for you here. Uh, why not the White House CIA crisis hotline number? And the code name for President Nixon was Olympus. He says, you got what? And I says, yeah, I got the number for President Nixon. You can call him up right now. He says, I don't believe it. So I says, here, you go ahead and do it. So I sat back, and I says, you better stack a few trunks before you do that, because if they find out you, you're calling this number, number they're going to nail you they're really, really bad. So he says, sure, I'll go ahead and do it. So he called up the number, and then my friend grabbed the phone and says, Olympus, please. And Nixon came on the line and said, um, and so we said, 
Sir, we have a national crisis on our hands. Sir, we're out of toilet paper. And we hung up. We call that the toilet paper White House crisis. Of course, it'll be in my book when it comes out. It's also on my website as well. But um, of course, I got thrown in prison for all this stuff because I seem to be the fall guy. And uh, during prison time, I had lots of fun. I hacked the prison phone network. I hacked their radios. I took the, uh, they got these really nice little FM radios and they're old fashioned. Uh, they're transistors, of course, but they have these little coils. So I took the local oscillator coil and, and unwound about 15 turns of the local oscillator coils, and that made it tune up higher frequencies. The, uh, the police at that time were using 150-something megahertz. FM was 108 megahertz. We only had to go up to 150. We could start picking up the walkie-talkies on a normal FM radio. And so we would, get, uh, we, would get, we would now tap them and tap their radio communication. And uh, so we were able to identify when certain instances come. We can tell when they're coming to our barracks and have pre-warning uh, of the authorities. And so uh, we, uh, I also gave phone freak lessons. I caught, taught everybody how to, how to phone freak. And uh, I also uh, met Steve Wozniak. Uh, that was uh, before I went to prison. And uh, Woz heard a, a, t a radio program on KPFA and saw the ESCO article and said, I have to know more about this. So he decided to build a blue box, but he didn't know what the frequencies were. He went down to Stanford, uh, okay, five minutes left. He went down to Stanford and he, uh, he uh, did a, uh, a uh, check and he found out what the frequencies were and built a blue box. And then he asked me to show him how to use it and so we called the Pope. So all in all, it was just pretty much uh, uh, me showing him how to do it and his blue box was made out of square waves instead of sine waves and many people who bought his box would get busted. I mean, big time, big time. One more thing I should say, what can your company do about this? I believe that they should monitor what their employees are doing. Uh, I don't really like, believe that they should be monitoring their email, but all new employees should always be required to be going into an orientation center with their company to be orientated on security issues in the company. What to say, what not to say, what to do, what not to do, how to use your computer and how not to use your computer. And network monitoring is also important using SNORT, IPSs, IDSs, and browsers should be hardened, especially ins inside your company and stuff like that. What am I currently doing? I'm currently uh, now starting a new LLC, uh, crunchcreations.org, building specialized teams. Remember what Don said about teams, they're very important. So we can call on when needed. And so uh, just stay tuned for my, uh, my uh, social networking, Facebook, and uh, LinkedIn, and you'll be finding out more about what I'm doing. I'm also writing a book. I just signed a book, a movie deal in Hollywood. Uh, I'm doing EcoVizo, which is a uh, uh, building sustainable communities, social networking, and Crunch TV. And this is how you can contact me. I'm JD Crunchman on all the social engines. See the pattern? It's all the same. I'm not like these other hackers that have a different name for every social network. It gets get so many confusing. So when people contact me, they say, what's your Skype name? Oh, gee, and then I get a Skype request. I don't know who he is because he's using a different name. So at this point, I think I'll uh, stop for questions and uh, because I've just been notified that I'm almost over with my time. So, any questions from the audience? There's a mic. We can also bring the mic to you. Yeah, I can bring the mic to you or you can come to the front. Is there any questions? Yeah. Have you ever had a question? Is yeah. it easier to start pockets today than it was in the 70s, or there is no difference but that? Time? Without a doubt, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Even, you know, using Skype. I mean, uh, just, uh, I think a couple of years ago, Skype went down for a couple of days, and uh, during that time, uh, that was a period that the Homeland Security people contacted the Skype people, and they said, uh, they said, we want you to install a knock-knock protocol into the Skype. So they disabled all current Skype users and requiring people to download the new Skype. And when you download the new Skype, uh, they have a knock-knock protocol. It's a special ping packet. And when they send the ping packet, it opens up a listener, and the listener can now listen in on calls. And, and it doesn't matter that they're encrypting it or not. They can still hear everything you see, and they can also see everything. They can see and hear you on Skype through this special knock-knock protocol. So yeah, Skype is very, very not very good to use for when you want to keep things away from the authorities. I don't care. I really don't care. 
I have never, I hardly ever use encryption anymore. I mean, why? It just attracts attention. And, I, and as, the more public I am, the more people know me, the better. I'm like Steve Wozniak. If you go to Steve Wozniak's Twitter account, and if you happen to be one of his friends, I can tell you exactly where he is at any given time. Oh, he was over at the, uh, he was over at the, uh, at the restaurant uh, at, uh, uh, two hours ago, or he was at the airport waiting for a plane, or whatever. So I know exactly where he is. And he knows exactly where I am because we're friends. We know where we, you know, we know where we all are, and uh, we don't care. And that's one of the things because uh, since I'm so public, there's nothing to hide. I can't possibly do anything illegal now, so I'm just have to be just totally open and be, you know, and be as free as I can. <laughs>